Morning came, and I hadn't put the shotgun down yet. I was still sitting at the end of the bed, checking the windows. It seemed like the tapping stopped around dawn. I heard my wife's alarm go off, and the sounds of her rousing from her sleep. Morning, honey, she mumbled, brunette hair a mass of frizz and tangles. Morning, I said simply, making sure she was okay. She got out of bed and headed for the bathroom. I heard my kids' alarms go off next and could hear my boys roughhousing in their room. My wife, Sandy, came out of the bathroom, toothbrush in hand, and was about to motion for me to go contain the wild animals that are my 15 and my 13-year-old boys. She stopped when she spotted the shotgun in my hand. She quickly spat out her toothpaste. Fred, why the hell are you holding a shotgun? She looked me up and down with her soft brown eyes. Are those the clothes you were in when you came home yesterday? Honey, I got a visit from a guy who's probably not human in the least. He threatened the family if I don't return a red blade-like object that came from some mysterious excavation site. That's the most truthful thing I wanted to tell her, but it probably sounded totally insane. The more I played the sentence over and over in my head, the more I questioned whether I was the one that was sane. Fred, she poked me in the shoulder. Apparently I'd been staring off into space, trying to think of a logical response to her completely irrational question. Someone was on the lawn last night. They were banging on the door and wouldn't go away until I got the shotgun. Sandy cocked her hips and shot me one of those emasculating wife stares. So rather than call the cops, he reached for the shotgun? I cocked the shotgun and cleared the ammo out before heading back down to the closet to put the shells away. Just wasn't sure if it was a prowler or dumb kids. Sandy poked her head out of the bedroom. Speaking of, Colin, Trevor, shake a leg. I closed the closet to see my boys bounding down the steps in various states of dress dragging their backpacks and heading for the table. They start fighting over cereal and I quickly resolve it, before a good scolding and getting them prepped for the bus. They finished up and are soon out the door with coats and sneakers on. My wife comes down next, wearing her robe. Don't you have that job today? I nod, looking at the time. Guess you're right. And get motivated, she says. I do and head out the door, giving the wife a kiss and heading back to the site, making sure that my toolbox is with me. It was about the same as the first morning. Timothy's there at the gate. He undoes the chain, and we all head to the mansion again. He props the doors open, and the crew heads in. I get the business squared away first. Chavez and Pete on the scissor lift to finish the few touches on the wall, while Bob and Mike get to mix in the quickcrete and fill in the gash on the floor. They also work on making sure these barriers between the gash and the rest of the work area, so we can work on the rest of the floor. During this prep work, I notice Mike eye in the doorway. Mike, you taking in the scenery? Mike points to the roof on the outside. Steepled. He leaned into the doorway, shining a light on the ceiling. Flat. It's an attic. I look at Mike. Mike pulls out a laser measure. Steeple peak is 53 feet. Ceiling is 50 feet. He leans out again. Low point on the steeple is 44 feet. Flat ceiling is 50 feet. I cut him off, though, grumbling a bit. It's our last day on the job, Mike. Get it done. That thing's probably on the fritz anyway. My eyes aren't on the fritz, Fred. Damn your eyes, I said, seeing Bob looking at the same thing Mike was. Bob, go do something. Bob seemed startled, but managed to compose himself and get back to setting up his tools. I walk past the crew as they prep and pop open my toolbox. I find the strange object artifact, I guess, or whatever it is, and pull it out of my toolbox as I head towards Timothy. Timothy is observing Chavez and Pete when he spots me coming. This wound up in my toolbox, I say, holding the object out to him. Timothy looks it over without touching it, then looks to me for a solid minute. This came from here? I nod from inside that gash in the floor. Timothy holds his right hand over the thing for a moment. Then he starts guiding his hand back and forth over it slowly. I got no clue what he's doing. I'm about to ask, but as I look up, I noticed his eyes seem to be more intensely blue than they were before, specifically his right eye. Timothy stops suddenly and just grabs the thing with his right hand and pulls it hard onto his grip. Thank you for returning this. He turns it over in his hand again, his eyes 
seem to be normal. It's, it's very rare to find. That's what your associate said. I was hoping to fish for some info. If this Belial guy knows Timothy, then Timothy should know him. Associate? He asked quizzically. Yeah, tall guy, kind of yellow eyes, way too perfect teeth. Timothy seemed completely confused. I'm afraid I don't know anyone like that. All my associates are here. I figured it was time to stop trying to get him to spill the beans and just come out and say it. Listen, the guy shows up last night, tells me he wants that thing, and then tells me his name is Belial and that you know him. Timothy's face got slightly pale. You're certain he said Belial? I just nodded at him. Timothy looks to the object and then walks to the door. Sorry for this, but I hope you have everything you need inside. And he shuts the doors. I'm a bit dumbfounded at this point. I thought you were concerned about ventilation. Timothy just walks right past me towards the barricades. Ventilation is the least of your worries at this moment. I turned around and the entire crew is dead silent. Not sure what to do as we hear some banging, a few doors closing, and then some rustling past the barricades. I just come out and say it. We got this one day to get the floor cleaned and get that gash in the smaller scrapes and holes plugged. Move it now and then we get the hell out of here. The crew seems pretty much on board and the sound of work soon overpowers anything else. It had been about a half an hour since Timothy left when I suddenly felt a hand on my shoulder and I spun around at a sheer instinct. A small round bottle was shoved into my hand. That's for you, Timothy said before he handed the bottle to the rest of the crew, too. I look and see it's just a small round glass bottle with a long spout on the top with a cap. Timothy doesn't have the object in question anymore, and as he heads towards the barrier again, I grab him. Hey, I need at least a what-the-hell-is-this explanation and a who-the-hell-is-that for the Belial guy. I glared at him. That is for protection against Belial, Timothy says, pointing at the bottle. That's half my question. Who the hell is Belial? I reiterated. Timothy looks up at the angelic statue, and I turn to see the large figure of Saint Denia. He's her opposite. Before he can elaborate, he's back behind the barrier. Just finish up today and get the hell out of here. That's all I can think of. I grab a pressure washer and start working alongside the guys to get things rolling. It's the end of the day, and it's cleanup time. Timothy opens the doors and checks outside for something, and we all start loading up the truck. Timothy looks around, seemingly satisfied. This is quite excellent work, Fred. Thank you. I nod, hoping we can finish up shortly. The gash in the floor is fully repaired, but it'll take 24 hours to cure. You can walk across it without much issue, though. We cleared up the main hall here, got the walls, the statues, the ceiling, and of course the floor is squared away. And the amphitheater, Chavez says, as he and Pete seem to be pulling equipment from the left side of the room. Pete's face is pretty pale as he walks by, but I stop them regardless. Amphitheater. Pete just looks at me and shakes his head. Chavez, that wasn't in the order, I said with a sigh. Timothy chimed in about that point. How did you get into the amphitheater? I'm never going to get out of this place, am I? So close, yet so far. Chavez happily shows us down the left-hand side of the hall and clicks on the light. A pair of massive 50-foot double doors stand right in front of us, each from the floor to the ceiling. The ceiling looks like it tapers to a dome. It's not so much that there's a pair of massive 50-foot tall doors right in front of me that are almost 20 feet wide. It's what's on the other side of these things. Carved into the marble are pictures of armor-clad angels with feather wings. Under their feet are various-looking creatures, a few of the angels standing over said defeated creatures with spears shoved into them. Others are in the process of smiting. As the doors go up, the carvings get wider. Not just feathery angels, but these other winged humanoid things. They look like lizards with wings. Stranger still is, at the very top of these doors, as a huge lizard-like figure, massive bat-like wings spread out, holding a shield with a cross on it and a huge spear. It's hard to see fully, but the doors seem to meet, or at least have to meet, in the middle where his face would go. 
If you could call it a face, I guess. It's mostly a lizard head with horns over a long snake-like tongue. Chavez takes a knee in front of the door and starts reciting God's prayer. One of them clicks open. Voice activated door or something, I ask, hoping there's some kind of rational explanation and wondering why we haven't left yet. Chavez gets up and opens the door enough to walk in. He drags one of the lamps in and powers it on, motioning for us to come in. We found this door here and Pete and I cleaned it up. It was easier than the rest. The floor here is different. I look down and thank God there's a seam. I finally found a seam in this place, but the seam is from the marble to granite. As I walked in, it's pretty clear that, oddly, everything is made of granite in this room. Stacking up in the darkness, so high you can't even tell, there's chairs. These chairs were large, stone chairs. They're all culminating around a central chair. A chair is an understatement. This was a throne. The chairs all surrounded the stage, and we found ourselves in a huge crescent. I turned to Timothy, whose gaze was transfixed on the central throne, that faraway look in his eye. Chavez was again the only one who spoke. Saint Denia? Timothy nodded and left the room. I didn't know how those doors opened. Thank you, Chavez. I clicked the lights off and pulled the lights out, making sure everyone is out of the now perfectly dark room. Good work, guys. Now get packed. I'm now overly invested in getting out of here as fast as possible. Pete leans over to me, whispering, The door outside and the amphitheater doors are on the same wall, but there's no structure on the outside that could fit that. I notice this as well and walk outside the mansion and then back inside. Pete? Yeah? Don't think about it. I guess that's the best bet, Pete said, just frowning at me. I give a final examination of the place, and before we kill the last of the lights, I do have to say the place looked nice. The white marble floor was polished to the point where I can see my reflection. The gash is sealed up nice and neat, and it just looks like a vein of marble now. Everything is looking perfect inside. The walls, the ceiling, the floor. I give a little nod to St. Denia and head to the door as the lights are taken down. I do my head count, and once again, I'm short one Honduran. I walk back inside to find Chavez kneeling in front of the statue of St. Denia, only the lights from the setting sun reflecting off the floor to light his room. Chavez, end of the day, let's go. I'm staying, he said simply. I notice the bottle that Timothy handed him is empty. Did you drink that? Do you even know what that is, Chavez? I said, a bit shocked. It's God's blessing. Chavez stood up and he just looked, for lack of a better word, happy, like a man without a care in the world. I'm not leaving you here, Chavez. The client isn't going to like you hanging around. Timothy chimed in about that time, walking back from behind the barrier. Actually, Chavez agreed to assist me in a few things going forward. I turned to look at Timothy. You ever think I might not want to lose a member of my crew? Chavez spoke up then. Mr. Fred, it's okay. I want to stay. I want to stay and help St. T Timothy interrupted him quickly. He, he volunteered. It's hard to say no to him. I gave Chavez a look. Nice working with you, Fred, he said, extending a hand. I ignored it. Get your head on straight. I'm your ride. I'm staying, Fred. I turn and shout. Chavez, I'm not staying here one minute longer, okay? I'm out. Done. Finished. I stopped for a second, because I didn't say finished. I said finito, but for some reason, it came out as English. I'm 100% done with this place, okay? I'm out. Job's done. You want to stay? Enjoy. I head towards my truck, look to my toolbox, ensure nothing else has found its way in there, and close it and get ready to go. As I head out the door, Timothy starts to close them behind me, him and Chavez still inside. Timothy looks to me before he closes the door. The remainder of your payment is in the truck everything we discussed. I cannot fully express my gratitude. He shuts the door, and we load up. I check the truck, and there's an envelope with the second half of the payment in it. I'm pretty shocked, and I count the bills a few times. It's up to ten grand. I've heard of getting a tip, but this was a bit overkill. I know one pair of kids whose college funds are going to be in a good place after all of this. At home, I'm doing the husband thing, cleaning up the dishes from the wife's dinner. 
Sandy and the boys are asleep, and that's when I hear the crash in the garage. I run to the closet, grab the shotgun, and fill it with a few shells before I run in. I'm kind of expecting him at this point. The toolbox and all the tools are strewn about on the floor. I see my garage door open slightly, and suddenly something small and almost glass-like hits me in the face. I look down to see what looks like a chunk of the object that was in my toolbox, about the size of a half dollar, land on the floor. That is but a pittance, Red Fred. I turn to the voice and see glowing yellow eyes in the darkness. Not nearly what I needed. I pull the gun and go to shoot, but I feel a tug against my entire body as if someone grabbed onto my sweatshirt from the front and pulled me downward. I barely take a step forward, but it's enough to get me to point the gun at the floor. I look up as Belial's hand drops from midair, steam rising off the black rings on his finger. Weak. Not this weak, though. Another hissing laugh. He offered you protection. How noble. Before I can take aim, a tool shoots out from the workbench and smacks into the shotgun, which lands a few feet from me. I lunge for it, but it suddenly leaps off the floor and into Belial's hand. He takes the shotgun and places it against his shoulder, looking down at me. As if this little bobble could do anything against me. I try to get up, but he places a foot on my shoulder and I can't move. You've done something very foolish, Red Fred. You've hidden the only thing that can help me move up from a puppeteer to a god. The shotgun barrels now slide under my chin and I see Belial's face illuminated by the light coming from the doorway. But there's hope for you yet. I was shaken at this point. I'm not sure how the tables had turned so fast. You can fix your mistake, and in return, I'll spare you and your family's lives. His voice wheezes, but not as much as it did before. He somehow seems a little stronger. Despite how I look, I've done quite a bit to exist in this world. Possessions, normally a lesser demon's game, but the discovery of that sanguine amber, I could not resist. He cocks the shotgun threateningly. I'm sweating and slowly trying to get to my feet. I'm on my hands and knees by the time I feel the barrels at the back of my head. Now, this is your next course of action. You will leave here right away and retrieve for me the sanguine amber you found. You will bring it back here. You will give it to me. In return, you will be at my side rather than in my path. I swear I can hear his grin somehow. Nod if you understand. I just nod. What else can I do? If you do not bring me the amber, if you do not return home, if you somehow reach out to Timothy for aid, I will go upstairs and I will make your children watch as I violate your wife in every way that you can and cannot imagine. You lay one hand on her and I'll... You'll what, mortal? I hear the safety slide off. You'll bleed for me? I relax as I hear the safety slide back on, the gun clattering to the floor. You're on the clock, Freddy. I look up and the garage is clean. The door isn't open. There isn't even a sign that I dropped the shotgun as it's sitting neatly on my workbench. I get to my feet, shaking, and turn to see a figure right behind me, causing me to shout in fear. Sandy's behind me and she punches me in the shoulder. Jesus, it's just me. Why are you so jumpy, Fred? What's going on? I rub my shoulders where she nailed me and try to figure out how best to protect my one family from someone who is clearly not of this world. That's when I remember what Timothy handed me at the work site. I rush to the closet to find my coat. Were you on the phone? I thought I heard you talking to someone, Sandy asked. I pulled the bottle out of my coat and turned to her, pressing the bottle into her hand. Sandy, I know how this is going to sound, but I need you to drink this and share it with the boys, okay? They're asleep, Fred, she said curtly. She looked at the bottle and raised an eyebrow. This isn't some random point where you poison us all and run off to Malibu with some bimbo, is it? I grab her by the shoulders and look her dead in the eye. I'm asking you to trust me. Just drink half the bottle. 
Split the rest between the kids, okay? I need you to do that for me now. Just drink half. Sandy's clearly worried now, but she undoes the clasp on the bottle. Okay, Fred, all right, calm down. She takes a swig, then another until the bottle's half empty and caps it. So I drank it. What? She trails off and suddenly closes her eyes, opening them again and looking right into mine. Oh, wow. It's probably the best water I've ever drank. Make sure you give the boys some, okay? I left something on the work site and I need to go get it. She just nods. Love you, Fred. Love you too, I said, letting go of her shoulder. Just make sure the kids drink that and keep the doors locked. Don't let anybody in, okay? Okay, Fred, she said with a nod. Be careful. She walked up the stairs, smiling serenely as I rushed out the door, locking it behind me to make my way to my truck. In retrospect, I should have kissed her. I was driving fast enough to be a little worried, but not fast enough to be pulled over. I got to the gate of the work site in roughly an hour, which was pretty good time from my house. I saw the gate wasn't chained up anymore, which seemed odd because Timothy had had to undo that chain every morning. Did he never leave the mansion after he closed those doors for the day? I hit my brights as I drove down the driveway, knowing it might be dark in that main hallway, and ran to the door. Timothy, open up! I slammed my fist on the door. Damn it, Timothy, open the damn door! I looked to see there was no padlock on the door, and jostled the old doorknob swinging the door open. Chavez, Timothy, I shouted into the empty room, expecting an echo, but I heard no sound. This musty scent hits me then, the smell of rotten wood and mildewed fabric. I look around, pulling out my flashlight. The boards are letting light in from the front. There's no statues, no marble floor, just a set of collapsed staircases and a rotting subfloor with a few ripped rugs and some graffiti. I took a step outside, just to confirm it was the right place, then peeked back in. The barricades were gone, the marble ceilings, the floors, the walls. It's as if it had never been there. I ran through the ruins of that ancient mansion. The mansion was mundane, old, too ruined to be fixed. It should have been knocked down. I try a door or two, each opening to rotting rooms. I eventually became overwhelmed with the fungus in the air as I stumbled out of the door, falling to my knees near my car. As I tried to catch my breath, I tried to figure out what the hell was going on. I turned to look at the old mansion behind me, and I could only think of one thing. The site we were working on was gone, or was never there in the first place, and the amber was gone with it. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. This is part three of Restoration, and if you're enjoying it, I definitely recommend you check out the other stories by Zathero. I've linked his subreddit and his Reddit account, so if you'd like to give a look, why not pop on by? He seems to have some exorcist stories up there, and I know you guys are fond of that. And we'll be covering part four next week, so don't miss that. Let's go ahead and thank our patrons. Thanks to Leslie Lou Riddle and Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton tier contributors. Thanks to Glenn Jenkins for being our Ghostly Writer tier contributor. And thanks to Zeronin for being our Ghostly Reader tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do it without you. This story was actually recommended by Glenn Jenkins, so if you're enjoying it, tell him thanks. If you would like to support the show and maybe have a story of your own read on here, come on down to Patreon. For just $5 a month, you can have your name read out at the end of every TikTok, in every YouTube video that I make. Patrons also get their videos a day early, and they can suggest a story for me to read on the channel. So, what are you waiting for? Come on down and see what all the fuss is about. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.